thank you everybody for joining us today for our webinar. Um, it's been a while since we've had a webinar and we're happy to see everybody here. I'm happy to have with us Evan Pappas and Daniel Conlon from Tucker Ahrensburg. They um, graciously came to us and said they had some great topics they wanted to cover and we thought this would be a wonderful one talking about BLC, not wonderful, but a good topic to talk about the BLCE and what you need to know and some best practices. As always, please keep your uh, mics muted during the presentation. Use the chat feature if you have questions. I will be monitoring that um, and we'll make sure that um, Daniel and Evan know the questions that are coming through. And um, with that, I'm going to pass this over to you, Evan, to get things started. Thank you, Hope. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us to talk about uh, PLCB and uh, BLCE, the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement. Um, my name is Evan Pappas. I am a shareholder at Tucker Arnsberg, and I'm here with uh, my partner, Daniel Conlin, also a shareholder. Um, we are co-chairs of the Hospitality Practice Group at the firm, and we work with a lot of uh, bars, restaurants, breweries, wineries, distributors, you name it, on a wide range of um, business issues. And a lot of those business issues pertain to our interface with the PLCB and liquor control enforcement. And uh, we thought it'd be a good topic to just remind ourselves of uh, how this all fits together and how we can be um, as compliant as possible so that we can remain in operation. Um, I have been in practice for, um, I guess, about 15 years, a little more, um, representing a wide range of businesses. Um, a large sector of that is in the hospitality industry from hotels, restaurants, manufacturers, and distributors. And um, it, 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 my representation spans from licensing issues um, all the way to defending against uh, certain enforcement actions by PLCB and liquor control enforcement. Um, and uh, with me also is Daniel Conlin, who has a sim similar but uh, not identical um, experience in the hospitality space. I'll let Daniel introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Evan. Uh, and thank you for the introduction as well as as my my partner Evan Papa said I I am a shareholder with him here at the law firm of, of Tucker Arnsberg. We both co-chair the hospitality practice. Our practice is a statewide practice. Evan's located in Harrisburg. I'm in Pittsburgh. We service clients from Pittsburgh all the way to Philadelphia and in central Pennsylvania as well. Um, I've been involved in uh, helping set up uh, single location restaurants, but I'm also general counsel to regional chain restaurants and, uh, and hospitality groups. Um, everything from you know the beginning of the uh, the application for transfer of an R liquor license, if it is an R liquor license, or on the manufacturer side, the uh, filing for uh, TTB applications at the federal level and then the applications with the PLCB. Um, we've helped clients with, with all of that. And as after we do that process, we, we often stay in touch with our clients. And while we don't desire or wish that they have any involvement with the state police, uh, with the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement, sometimes that's just, uh, that just happens, right? I just had a client recently who we got his license for uh, a couple of years ago that was subject to an undercover investigation re revolving um, or involving um, alleged gambling machines at his premise. Um, and, you know, we have we have criminal lawyers in our practice. We have people like Evan Pappas and I who have been through this process. And we want to be able to share with you some tips about how to deal with the state police, how to deal with the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement, and hopefully this will help you as, as owners um, in, in your business. I'll pass it back to you, Evan. Thank you. Um, so before I get into the next slide, I just wanted to mention um, that if you have questions that come up during our presentation, 
um, enter them into the comment uh, feature in the Zoom um, screen and Hope will either during the slide, I don't mind interruptions during the presentation, uh, but Hope will at some point uh, ask that question on your behalf and I'll do my best to give you a response as will Daniel. Um, so if you could flip to the next slide, um, some of the things we're gonna cover, um, the, the main purpose, I guess you could say for today is I wanted to outline the different roles played by the Liquor Control Board vis-a-vis -vis Liquor Control Enforcement uh, because they're two separate organizations and they have different roles over your business. And I think that the first step in uh, being proactive is, is knowing this difference and knowing the different roles that each uh, regulator plays here. Um, so we'll go through the differences, uh, the, the main functions of the PLCB, uh, primary functions of liquor control enforcement, that's BLCE for short. Um, we will talk about the citation process, um, how adjudications are um, handed out and, and briefly the appeal process there. Um, this notion of double jeopardy uh, doesn't apply to you as a licensee. Um, if, if I don't touch on it, remind me later what this really means, but um, I mentioned the separateness between Liquor Control Enforcement and Liquor Control Board, and the purpose of this bullet is to help licensees understand that even after you've received a citation and maybe paid a fine or served a suspension as a result of your citation, you could still have further consequences on the PLCB side, even after you've um, sort of done your time, so to speak, on the uh, citation. So I think that's an important concept to understand um, that you could have two consequences as a result of receiving citations. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, what are some of the major infractions that licensees are getting cited for under the liquor code? Um, we'll get into what is a substantial remedial measure um, in response to a citation you might receive. Um, we'll talk about what non-renewal of a license is and, and what a conditional license agreement is. Um, there's, there's a lot of folks on this call, some of which I know and a lot of which I do not know, and there's likely to be a range of experiences uh, some of you may be well familiar with some or all of these topics, and this may be brand new for some of you. So I encourage you to ask even the most basic questions or the most complicated question um, that's on your mind, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to handle that. So let's start with the next slide um, with the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. Uh, we're all familiar likely with the PLCB. Um, they're the main regulator for all liquor sales in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and they are composed of this three member board and they get um, appointed by the governor and they serve for, for various um, terms and they make the um, I guess, important decisions with regard to a licensee's ability to operate. So they make decisions sometimes with regard to initial licensing, um, whether or not to approve certain orientations of a licensee's premises. Um, and sometimes they will vote whether to cancel your license or allow you to continue operating. So they that three member board, um, although they have public meetings and you're invited to attend, rarely are they attended. And most of what they do is um, seemingly behind this uh, curtain that uh, we don't really understand um, how it all fits together and how the decisions get made. But th that three member board 
makes most of the decisions, uh, the important decisions regarding your license. Uh, there's several departments within the PLCB from education, um, the licensing uh, department, which is the department that oversees the application and uh, the process for issuing new licenses, um, as well as the legal department that handles the legal matters on behalf of the PLCB. Um, and I mentioned this separateness between the PLCB and liquor control enforcement. And here's one example of many. Uh, the PLCB has its own legal department and they advise and represent the, the PLCB for a number of matters ranging from non-renewal hearings, um, as well as conditional license agreements, among other things. But the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement has its own separate legal department uh, that they use to adjudicate citations against licensees. And we'll get into that in a moment. But when you go to a hearing related to service to a minor, for example, on a citation, that hearing will be um, with Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement Legal Counsel, not Liquor Control Board Counsel. Um, this next bullet with the wine glass, we, we know th this is a unique regulator because not only are they your primary regulator from sort of a gatekeeping perspective, they also sell and wholesale wine and spirits. They're the, the, the leading um, seller of wine and spirits in the Commonwealth. And in fact, I think they are one of the largest purchasers and resellers of wine and spirits in the United States. Um, so that's a unique regulatory position to hold where you are regulator and salesperson, but we won't let that kind of cloud the topic. I uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, all new license applications uh, have to be filed with the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board and, and their Bureau of Licensing will handle those applications and determine whether you have sufficient criteria to get a license. Um, the PLCB has its own investigatory process, which is separate also from the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement. Uh, the PLCB investigation process is mainly focused on your criteria and, and worthiness to be a licensee, um, whereas liquor control enforcement oversight will begin once you become a licensee and they sort of regulate your conduct after you become a licensee. Um, there's a uh, an advisory opinion option that the PLCB offers, which can be a fairly valuable tool for licensees that have questions regarding um, what they're permitted to do with their respective licenses. And um, it, it can sometimes take a few weeks, maybe more to get a response to a request for an advisory opinion um, but you, if you have a legal issue, um, you can submit for one on your own, or you can work with legal counsel to have a request for an advisory opinion submitted. And you essentially ask your question to the legal department. And if your application is submitted in your own name, in other words, you disclose your LLC name and you know the, the license that you're asking the question about, that advisory opinion will be binding on the board as to what your question was. So if they grant you the permission to, to do a certain thing through an advisory opinion, they can't later come cite you for the same conduct. You'll have been kind of given an individual permission through that advisory opinion. But that's a nice feature that they offer uh, because sometimes these issues are pretty gray and there's not a right or wrong answer and it can help to 
get some guidance from the PLCB. Um, any other comments on that slide, Daniel, before we move on? Evan, just one comment uh, that I want to make everybody aware of is that this three member board has delegated certain powers to its departments. In particular, I'm thinking of the licensing department within the PLCB. So licensing may have what will would have direction to decide whether a an application for a transfer that is close to a church or a school um, is going to be permitted or not permitted. Um, so they can delegate that type of authority, which gives licensing more authority in some cases. Um, so I just, I, I wanna highlight that, that you know this board doesn't deal with all of the transfers uh, filed in the Commonwealth. Um, if, if in fact that authority has been delegated to licensing. Thank you. That's a good clarification. Mm -hmm. Not everything goes to the three member board, but some things do. And it's, it can sometimes be, um, difficult to know what, what things need to go to board approval or not, but, but you're right. Licensing has broad discretion to approve or deny even without the three member board. Um, the, the next slide gets into some more of the specifics on the role of the PLCB and how it differs a little bit from the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement. Um, I mentioned their role as sort of a gatekeeper and determinant of whether you get your liquor license or not, whether it's a transfer application, whether it's an economic development application or a brand new application for a new license. Um, but the PLCB is mainly concerned with the non-operational criteria and the ability of an applicant to run the license establishment. So what I'm getting at here are um, things that you'll have to address either in your very initial application or very soon after your first application, but they're gonna to wanna to know what the entity is that you're applying through, who are the owners and or investors that are contributing money to the project, um, uh, what prior history do you have either as a licensee um, with regard to citations or other um, positive or negative experience with the PLCB, as well as criminal history can uh, frequently disqualify applicants from liquor license. Um, they are interested in the layout of the premises and um, want to make sure that you have the basic uh, qualifications for a restaurant or um, manufacturing facility. And the, the graphic on the right is just, uh, just something I found on the internet. It's not a restaurant I'm familiar with, but it's there also to help, um, I guess, show that these layouts of the premises, they don't need to be formal blueprint plans. They can be simple layouts that are kind of drawn by hand by you, but um, certainly going to be part of that application process is the, the criteria of the restaurant interior itself, <laughs> excuse me, including connections that your space may have to either other businesses inside the suite or connections to other suites in, let's say, a strip mall may have a door that connects to another business. Um, these are issues that you need to work out ahead of time, and they're going to need to be addressed by the investigators when they come out to investigate um, the license application. Uh, they'll also look at proximity to other licensed establishments, as well as uh, Daniel mentioned briefly proximity to churches. Um, 
that can be an issue. It's rarely the sole issue that will deny a license, but um, they are able to um, include as part of their inquiry your location um, and how close you are to other licensed establishments, schools, as well as religious institutions. Um, and I think that those concerns become more red hot if there are objections posed by a school or by a church to your uh, license. Um, and if there are no objections, you can't say it won't be an issue, but it's, it's less likely to become an issue. Um, so the, the other thing, and this leads into the liquor control enforcement slide that's coming up, the liquor control board is not typically there to inspect your day-to-day -day operations. They come out to make sure that you have the necessary criteria to become a licensee. And once you are licensed, your um, regulation for day-to-day -day activities becomes sort of delegated to the liquor control enforcement side to make sure that you're not violating the liquor code. Um, but it's not a complete delegation of authority because while P uh, Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement may monitor and cite you for operational violations, those um, violations get reported back to the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board and um, get noted on your record uh, for your license, and, and they remain uh, forever. And we'll get into that a little bit on a couple of the next slides. Um, anything on uh, PLCB before I kind of segue over to liquor control enforcement? Daniel, or any questions at this point? No, no, I don't have anything to add, Evan. Thank you. Okay. Um, the Bureau, uh, next slide, please. Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement is, um, it's a division or branch of the Pennsylvania State Police. It's not an arm of the Liquor Control Board at all. Um, and they've had their authority delegated to them, as Daniel said, uh, the board can do. Um, but this was a statutory delegation of authority that created um, the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement in the state police. And what they do is essentially they train officers who are not per se state troopers, but they do receive alcohol training from the state police, um, what to look for and how to conduct their investigations. And they inspect as many of the licensed organizations throughout the state as possible. Now they have a limited resources, so it's not a guarantee that you're going to see liquor control enforcement once a year or, or twice a year. You may not see liquor control enforcement for many years, if at all. Um, but it's not just bad operators that get visits from liquor control enforcement. Liquor control enforcement does investigate widely and they will come investigate your operation, whether or not you're deemed to be sort of a problem nightclub or just uh, sort of the local family restaurant. So it's to be expected that they will eventually come um, to inspect the premises. Um, and when they, when they come out, they're looking for any number of infractions uh, of the liquor code. And I'll get into some of those in a moment. But the investigations they conduct are sometimes a result of a tip that they may receive from either the public or maybe a competing bar or restaurant quite frequently are the source of complaints. And sometimes they will 
initiate their own investigation based on their own priorities. For example, if they feel that there is a town or city that they feel is serving minors in a, in a higher concentration than, than other areas, sometimes they'll focus an investigation for an extended period of time throughout an entire municipality. Um, State College being one example where I believe this has happened. Um, I've said it once, I'll say it again, they're independent from the PLCB, um, which, which means that at least publicly, there, there should never be a referral of an investigation from the PLCB to the BLCE. Um, the, the BLCE takes its own investigative priorities uh, from its own sources, and, and I don't believe that they get told what to do uh, by the PLCB. Um, there are examples, however, where um, licensees may feel that they're being targeted. They may have liquor control enforcement visit on a more regular seeming basis than some of their competitors. And they may be also fielding correspondence simultaneously from the PLCB regarding non-renewal. So it may sometimes feel like uh, there's a ganging up on the licensee between the two organizations, but that's because they operate separately and their adjudications are affecting different parts of your business. Um, for example, liquor control enforcement issues a citation, and once it becomes um, adjudicated, uh, then that's a, a, an adjudicated, I call it a black X on your license, um, that will remain permanently um, on your license for as long as you are an operator of a liquor licensed establishment. And um, that's the end of liquor control enforcement's priority or, or regulatory authority over the situation. At that point, once that citation has been adjudicated, it just goes on your history. And then it becomes liquor control board's authority to decide whether they want to renew you or not renew you based on that history. And we'll get into that, that renewal process too in a moment. Um, Investigations by the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement are not always one visit where they come in and do an investigation and leave. They can be several days, and I've seen some last as long as a few weeks, where they come and they visit periodically, and they can uh, accumulate more than one violation against the licensee based on their their numerous visits to the bar over a period of time. So um, just to be wary, if you, for example, become aware that liquor control enforcement was in your establishment, um, I wouldn't rest assured necessarily that the next day they won't be there or the next week they won't be there. It's almost impossible to tell unless they announce their presence, whether they're there and that kind of rolls into the next bullet. Um, liquor control enforcement officers can not only be in plain clothes, but they can fit in with your patrons. So they can sit at the bar, be drinking the Miller Lite, and also be watching for you to violate the liquor code. So um, you have to be I can't even say you have to be vigilant because you may not know that these two individuals are liquor control officers. So you have to be constantly vigilant and assume that everyone is liquor control enforcement because any single violation can justify a citation by uh, liquor control enforcement. Evan, if if I may, yeah, please. 
A good number of the cases that Evan and I see involve undercover investigations regarding the sale of liquor to minors. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that there's, there has to be at least one person on this webinar who unfortunately has had this experience. Um, what, what will happen is that the, uh, an, an undercover agent who is underage will go into the premise, uh, sit at the bar, present uh, an ID to the bartender, and, and the, uh, the ID will show that this individual is underage. Um, and they're documenting this. Uh, the bartender will then serve the alcohol to the agent um, or the undercover individual. This individual will then pay for the, the Miller Lite or, or the beer, whatever alcoholic beverage they ordered, and then they will walk out of the premise. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, um, an, an overage, or should I say a, an officer, an enforcement officer of age will come in and issue the ticket. Um, and those types of cases, um, the, the investigator has, has teed up the case, you know, perfectly to where, where they want it. They want, um, they, they're able to demonstrate that the that there was a minor at the premise that the minor you know disclosed their age and despite having disclosed their age that an alcoholic beverage was served to that individual and that they paid for it those cases are very difficult to defend i want to distinguish those cases from other cases where you are cited for serving a minor and it wasn't as part of an undercover investigation, then the licensee may have a good faith defense in those cases. Those cases may be worth taking to a hearing, which I'm sure Evan will get to into a bit. But those undercover investigations involving sales to minors are very difficult to defend. Um, and what I can say is it, that underscores the need to be able to train your servers and train your waiters on um, on ramp um, on and and do continual uh, training to make sure that your your employees are serving alcohol responsibly at the premise. Um, so I'll I'll pass it back to you, Evan. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right. The underage compliance check type citation is one of the most difficult. And um, Crystal Hartz, one of our attendees, also had a, um, a comment in the chat that th this is what makes it really hard for owners. Everyone on this call knows you have to be 21 to buy alcohol. Okay, I'm not teaching anyone new by that. Um, and most of your staff know this too. But your staff your bartenders and the waitresses and waiters, they are your first and only defense against a citation like this. And I hate to sound um, cynical when I say this, but they don't care whether you get a citation. And they may get fired and they may have something in an employment agreement that you know they may have to pay you back for your fines if you have to pay them. But it's a very difficult, um, it's a lot of responsibility to give a non-owner, um, which is this responsibility for carting individuals. And different licensees have different ways around this with ID scanners and bracelets and making sure only people that are 21 are in a certain area of the bar. But things happen and mistakes happen. And I guess the most important thing that you can do is be training employees and until you're blue in the face, because they will nod their head that they understand that they can't serve um, a minor. But as Crystal points out, sometimes a person will assume that if a minor is brave enough to hand me their ID, they must be 21. 
no one would do such a, a foolish thing as to hand an ID and they're not 21, but they do. And that's how you get caught in the underage compliance check because they are an actually underage male or female, and they are handing you their actual Pennsylvania state issued ID. So um, you have to look at the age and um, maybe having one of those, um, those tear off calendars that says, if you were born before this date, you're not 21. Um, as silly as that sounds, it might help remind your checkout clerk um, what the, the date is that they need to be aware of for someone uh, to be over 21. Anyway, I don't want to overly hammer that. Um, but the um, liquor control enforcement um, will hand out if they if they come in and they we could go to the next slide, please. Also, um, if they come in during an investigation they are most likely going to be operating undercover. Sometimes they will come in and they will disclose who they are. And in that case, they're not really concerned with minors, um, but they may be more concerned with your record keeping and they may want to talk to the manager on duty or the owner, and they may want to see business records. Uh, but if, if they do come in, they find something wrong, you'll first be issued what's called a notice of violation um, and you'll sometimes get the notice of violation the same day, maybe a day or three or four later, but usually promptly after the incident occurs. Um, and that's because sometimes you won't even know an incident occurred right when it occurs. You may not know until you get your notice of violation that there was an enforcement officer that found an issue on your uh, premises. So um, first you get the notice of violation and then a citation, the formal write-up of what happened will come later, sometimes a month or more later. And um, the reason I think it's important to know this is you need to do an investigation pretty promptly after you know that there was an issue. You need to talk to your staff, look at video footage, you need to start working with counsel or your own executive staff to figure out what happened and whether or not there's any plausible defense or rationale to, to the incident. Um, the citation process um, it, it sets into motion a process similar to a speeding ticket. Now, I, after I wrote that, and now I'm seeing it on screen, it's a little more serious than a speeding ticket, but it is, um, it, it's um, a different venue. You're not having these heard at small claims court like a, a speeding ticket would be. These are heard through the administrative law judge, which is a separate adjudicatory body set up specifically to hear um, violations of the liquor code. So these judges hear nothing but um, liquor code violations. So they, you know, although they may be like a small claims court, it's a very specialized court. They're very familiar with the liquor code, very familiar with the operations of liquor control enforcement. And you may feel sometimes like the chips are stacked against you in this venue, as well as uh, the PLCB venue, um, because you're there uh, with an allegation that you did something wrong. And there are witnesses with evidence to say that you did something wrong. Um, the, another important thing to note, I didn't, I think I forgot to make this a, a bullet, but Violations of the liquor code are what are known as strict liability offenses. Um, what that means, most offenses, civil or criminal, if it occurs, you get a chance to defend yourself. You have a side of a story to tell. And although we're given this hearing process through the administrative law judge, your violation of the liquor code 
is strict liability. So for example, with a sale to a minor, if they establish sale to minor occurred, doesn't matter what your side of the story is, you're guilty. That's a violation of that section of the liquor code. So um, there have been examples where um, licensees have either been unaware or the service was intentional or there was another thing distracting a bartender's attention at the time the service occurred. Uh, there's there's another example, sort of an, an off um, or a strange example where an underage compliance check occurred at a licensed establishment, which was um, a manufacturer. So this was um, not a big bar restaurant, but they were selling bottles of wine spirits to go from their establishment. And an underage compliance check occurred and into the establishment, and there were no people inside the business. And inside came the underage buyer, and followed by her were two um, liquor control enforcement officers wearing trench coats and sunglasses inside. And the licensee panicked because he thought he was going to be robbed by the people in the trench coats, served the minor, and then later found out that this was an underage compliance check, not a holdup. Um, and, you know, as ridiculous as that defense may sound now, this guy was legitimately concerned that there was going to be a holdup and he was just trying to get this customer out of his store. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It's a strict liability offense. And there's very little you can say or do to get um, to get out of a lot of these defenses. Um, but um, if you do want to defend, and, and before I even get there, I mentioned that citations, once they're adjudicated against you, go on your permanent record. So the decision whether to defend or not should be taken very seriously. And I say that because as I observe the citation process and the attempts by liquor control enforcement to encourage licensees to essentially plead guilty to charges um, leads me to believe that people are being um, unnecessarily led to kind of take what appears to be a lesser penalty um, and not knowing that that penalty then gets noted by liquor control board and can come back to haunt you later um, in the form of a non-renewal. And, and I will hit that point again, but you, you really can't just plead guilty to, to every offense. Now, we mentioned the, the underage compliance check. Cases are very difficult, but it, it really should not be a mindless oh, let's just pay the fine and, and move on kind of thing. You really, if you have any basis to defend, you should really consider that because you want to try at all costs to keep these adjudications off of your record. Um, fines really range, can be a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars, but more often than not, they're less than hiring an attorney. And that's part of the... Um, I guess encouragement here is, you know, the, they'll encourage you to take a, um, a guilty plea. It's not called a guilty plea. It's called an admission and waiver, um, even where you may have a viable defense. So again, I encourage you to make sure that you understand the implications and what facts you may have um, at your back before you decide to file an admission and waiver. Um, I mentioned that there's a permanent blemish on the PLCB record um, and um, that you have to conduct an investigation early so you don't lose valuable evidence. And um, too often, licensees wait until they get the formal citation 
And sometimes they even wait a couple months later before they bring that to us to see if there's anything that they should do. And they may not have those employees anymore, or they may have lost the video footage that could have helped them defend the citation. So it's very important to try to act as soon as possible to get a good sense of what the story is. Um, so just Evan, to add to what you said, uh, and I'll, I'll give, I'll give the audience an example of where you may not want to plead guilty or you may not want to sign an admission and waiver form. Um, if your premise, if your license has been subject to several um, violations, and let's just use the service to minors violation, um, so that since that one is, is very common, if your license has been subject to that violation repeatedly in the last few years, um, you know, the first time, you know, you get a lower fine, $250, $300, you know what, I'll just pay the fine and move on with life. You get a second one, um, the lawyers, the lawyer for the state, for the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement will recommend a higher fine, $500 to $1,000. And you may still say, okay, well, they got a second time, I'll just pay the fine and move on with life, right? But then you get a third one, also for sale to minors, the fine's going to be higher, $2,000, $3,000. Maybe at that time, it makes a good business decision to, to think uh, about fighting that, uh, that, viol that notice of violation, that citation, if you have a defense, of course, right? Don't just go there, you know, um, for no reason. But if you have a defense, maybe that's when uh, the license and see evaluates whether this is an opportunity to go to court on this citation. And, and another reason is at a third citation for a sale to minors, for example, um, as Evan said, that's, that's gonna show up on the record for your license. And when your license is renewed every year or you apply to renew your license to the PLC yes. every year, you're, they're going to look at that. They right. will definitely look at that. So you may, you may have to take that citation to a hearing, right? Um, so just, just be wary of that. You know, if, if you admit to three, four, five violations to minors, it may have, you know, the fine may be $3,000, $4,000 and a suspension, uh, but really the consequences could be graver. They could be bigger if uh, during non-renewal, uh, the PLCB decides not to renew. Right. The um, liquor control enforcement side, i.e. the administrative law judge can issue fines and also suspend your license Typically, though, suspension as a result of service to a minor, if it's a repeated violation, may only be a day or up to a week, perhaps, of a suspension, whereas the Liquor Control Board process, if they want to revoke, that's game over for your license. It's not just a minor few day suspension. It could be the end of your ownership of the liquor license. And I think that's a good time to slide to the next um, uh, slide here. This is now the title non-renewal hearings, which has come up a couple times in this presentation. This is now once the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement adjudications have wound their way through the process, they've become adjudicated against you negatively, and now they're on your history for the PLCB. And as Daniel said, um, each year you do either a renewal or a validation. And when you go to renew your license, uh, most times it's the payment of a fee and you click a few buttons and that's it, you're renewed. Um, however, if you have enough of a citation history, 
you may get flagged for non-renewal, also known as the nuisance bar program. Um, but the standard is under the liquor code, two or more adjudicated citations, which is a very low bar. We don't often see a non-renewal for just two citations, although it's their statutory ability to do so. Um, non-renewal, I've always thought of as just a nicer way of saying, we're taking your license away, you're revoked. Um, because non-renewal sounds very soft to me, but it is a very serious undertaking um, where you will um, be scheduled for a hearing where your entire operating history will undergo scrutiny. Um, this hearing process is heard before a PLCB employed hearing examiner who hears the evidence from both sides, the PLCB, who will admit evidence against you, and they'll hear evidence from you, and then they will make a recommendation to the three-member board. So um, it's, it's um, a difficult process where um, you know, you're going to have to address all of your shortcomings, perhaps, as a licensee, and not only address the citations and other negative evidence they may bring um, to the forefront, but you will then also need to show how and why you've been a good operator. You may need witnesses who can testify with regard to your operational history and um, letters of support from the public and um, character witnesses are also um, very helpful for non-renewal hearings like this. You essentially have to prove to the Liquor Control Board that you're still a person of good repute, as the Liquor Code puts it, and that you uh, should be permitted to continue owning your license. Essentially, that you're a good operator and that the operating history shouldn't disqualify you from owning the license. Um, the hearing process is much like a normal court hearing, although it's not in a big courtroom. Um, so it can be a little informal in that sense, but the rules of evidence are taken seriously. And the PLCB is very active in their attempt to restrict the types of evidence we as licensees might want to present to show our good operating history. Um, for example, uh, we had uh, in one licensee's case, we had um, six witnesses show up on behalf of a distributor who um, was very concerned about this license being revoked. And they had some political connections that they thought would be helpful witnesses. So we had some fairly important people show up as witnesses, to put it lightly. And they all took off from work. They all had to travel long distances to get there. Um, we weren't able to present all of our witnesses because the Liquor Control Board attorney and the hearing examiner agreed that they were all just going to say the same thing. So we're not going to hear all the evidence. So it can be a very frustrating um, process of trying to get your side of the story heard. But that's where legal counsel can, can be almost an absolutely necessary um, partner in this process to help you present the necessary evidence to try to save your license. Um, so the PLCB in their case against you is going to present your citation history, which is not just related to your ownership of that license. So for example, we had a, a client who has been in the, um, 
has owned liquor licenses since the 1960s. And um, we had a non-renewal hearing in the early 2000s for one of the licenses that they owned. And at the non-renewal hearing, all of the citations from all of his other five or six prior ownership of licenses were admitted into evidence against him to show why he was not a bad op- or why he was not a good operator and that the license should be revoked. So the license or the citations, these adjudications, they follow not only your entity, your LLC or your corporation that you do business under, but they follow the owners. So if you are, let's say, a husband-wife owner and you get a series of citations and wife goes and divests herself from that liquor license and owns another liquor license, let's say for a brewery, um, her operating history for the other license will become relevant during her ownership of the brewery license. So these things follow you permanently, not only the organization, but the individual. So it's very important to to know that. Um, And it's not just citation history, but non-payment of taxes I've seen has been admitted as a negative symbol of an operator's ability to run their business. Um, Criminal history certainly can come up. Um, but also police incidents that occur on or about the licensed premises. I find this is an interesting aside because these are incidents that you may not be responsible for at all. You may not have been aware that they even happened. But let's say a fight occurs in the parking garage across the street from your bar at three o'clock in the morning. You may not hear about that incident until a non-renewal hearing occurs and the PLCB has as part of its evidence these 10 police incidents that occurred outside of your bar. Um, So it's important to know that these things also count against you in some cases. Um, So it's important when you are a licensee in an area or you run a type of establishment where you might have to call the police, um, it it should call into question another um, priority, which is, do you really need the police? Did this happen on your premise or off premise? Um, the, The goal here would be to keep your name and the name of the premises out of this. So if you, the owner of the bar, make the call to the police, more likely than not that that's going to wind up as a citation or a um, a, um, a police incident related to your establishment. Whereas if a third party calls and there's no reference to the bar, it might not get on the radar of the PLCB. So um, sort of a little known fact that even these little police incidents that occur, and this doesn't happen at every institution, but it does happen Uh, where police are needed outside. Um, And you would think the responsible thing to do is call the police so that they can help resolve the situation. Um, Unfortunately, that can have an unintended negative consequence for the licensee. I'm not saying don't call the police in these situations, but but I am saying that there's a, a consideration here that goes beyond just someone was in a fight. So you might not want to just impulse call the police. It also is an opportunity for licensees to become familiar with and um, have a good relationship with the police that um, are in their municipality because they can be uh, your allies. Um, There's at the bottom here reference to conditional license agreements Um, a conditional license agreement is an opportunity that is sometimes given to licensees, um, where 
you're in a non-renewal hearing and it's usually given as an opportunity after the non-renewal hearing. So at a point where you don't yet know whether you're going to get to keep your license, you'll get a phone call or a letter from uh, the legal department with the PLCB offering what's called a conditional license agreement, which imposes sort of contractual obligations on you as a licensee to like have an age ID scanner, to monitor parking lots, perhaps to get ramp certification, various requirements put on you that you would have to sign the agreement and agree to maintain certain code of conduct. And if you do receive one or more, sometimes two or more citations of a certain variety, then you are now contractually obligated to put your license in safekeeping until it's sold. So it it's sort of a get out of jail free card, but it then puts you sort of in a contract with the board um, that if you then get another citation, you may be contractually obligated to put your license in safekeeping as opposed to um, have an opportunity to present your case um, like we talked about before a hearing examiner. Um, we're getting, I realize this is, we're into the 1130 hour here. So we're at the one hour mark. Um, I wanted to quick run through some of these things that could result in a citation uh, from liquor control enforcement. Obviously, we talked about minors, service to drunk people. Um, and it's not a blood alcohol drunk. It is a do you appear drunk? So glassy eyes and boisterous behavior is enough to deem somebody visibly intoxicated. And if you serve that person, you can be cited for serving a visibly intoxicated patron. Um, failure to have books and records on the premises ready for inspection by LCE. Um, music being heard off of the licensed premises is a, a pretty popular one because it's very difficult. If you have live music and you open the door and you can hear the music outside, that's potentially um, a liquor license citation. Um, lewd conduct, um, sales occurring after hours, not cleaning beer taps on a frequency that's required, um, or a manager not being available. These are just a few of the possible um, things you could be cited for, but these tend to be some of the more frequent things that we see licensees are getting cited for, especially service to minors, because these compliance checks are so fail safe from the um, Bureau's perspective. They, they seem to lead with that as a priority these days. Um, this next slide is, is, I think we've sufficiently covered this, but your, your business is subject to multiple layers of overlapping authority from liquor control board, liquor control enforcement. There's law enforcement that can have an impact. Um, I didn't even list in this uh, Venn diagram, Department of Revenue, uh, license and inspections, your local municipality. So you're subject to perhaps more layers of regulatory authority than any other business in the Commonwealth. So it's important to know your regulators um, as you embark on, on this journey. Um, that's all I have as far as the presentation. Are there any questions that came up in the chat that, that we should address? I did not see any. Um up um, in the chat, but there was a question that you had listed here that I thought would be interesting to cover. Is there a way to exclude or prevent the LCD yes. investigators from coming on site to perform the investigation, like on a busy night? Right. So that's, I think, something a lot of licensees wish they could do because sometimes the identity of a liquor control enforcement officer may be known. And that, that could be an advantage because you could, if you know that's an LCE officer, maybe you could let your staff know. But it is a violation in and of itself to deny liquor control enforcement access 
to, to perform their investigation. So it's almost as bad as getting a citation for serving a minor than denying them access to your books and records. Um, what you can do, though, um, is let's say they want to see books and records and they're not there. They're not always on site, although they should be. What you can say to an enforcement officer, and it's their discretion at this point, whether they entertain your request, but you can say the owner may have taken these home. Um, can you give me a day? Can you come back tomorrow? I'll make sure they're here. Sometimes they're willing to entertain that request for an additional day. Or if, let's say, your manager is not on site when they should be, um, you can maybe ask for an additional concession that they come back another day or in, a, in two days, rather than say, no, they're not here, and just clam up. That may result in a citation without giving yourself the ability to get the records that you need on site. Uh, but no, you can't prevent them from coming in, unfortunately. Great, thank you, Evan. I, another one that I thought was interesting that you had was if a person attempts to purchase alcohol from the bar, they are appearing to not be 21, but their ID is valid. Can you deny service to someone? So you can deny service even though they have a valid ID, just based on your perception that they may not be 21. However, there is an important um, defense to a service to minor um, infraction. So let's say this minor comes in and they present a valid ID, or they're not a minor, they're of age, but they just look young, and they present you an ID that appears to be valid um, if you take this specific set of steps, it will be what's called an affirmative defense to your citation hearing for serving a minor. But you have to do this exact set of steps. You first have to ask the patron whether they are over the age of 21 or not after they've showed you their ID and they have to answer the question. Um, then there is an option of a next set of steps. You then either get them to sign a declaration of age card or take a picture of their ID or additionally scan it through an age verification scanner. Um, my recommendation is rather than treat these things as um, or options, do all of these things. If this person presents and you're unsure, ask them if they're 21, get a picture of the ID, have them sign an age verification card. And if you don't have an, an, uh, an ID scanner, that's fine. You've complied with the code and you've activated that defense. Um, take a look for the, um, they're not easy to find, the uh, declaration of age cards. Um, but it's, it's worth at least knowing this, but you do have an option. You don't have to serve, or if you'd like to serve, I recommend you, you follow these steps so that you can show the administrative law judge, I did the right things here before we serve this minor. Therefore, I shouldn't be found guilty for the service to minor. So thank you. It's a good one. Yeah, I thought that was too. Actually, that happened to my daughter once. <laughs> Oh, really? and, she was, and she was 21, but she was like, all right, I guess you're not going to do it. Um, I think the other ones you really covered well during the whole presentation. Um, we do have the, uh, you know, thank you, Evan. Thank you, Daniel, for taking the time today to present this information. I think it's really important for us to understand um, the, you know, LCB, BLCB, understand the relationship. If you have, um, you know, we will be sending out this presentation. It has been recorded. We will send out. Evan and Daniel's information, please reach out to them. If you have questions that you just don't feel comfortable answer, you know, asking right now on this um, webinar, I'm sure they'd be open to talking at least through some of the uh, specifics there. Absolutely, like yeah. If anyone has specific questions or a follow-up question from today, please call me. That's my direct dial number. Uh, you can email me and uh, we're happy to talk to you.
So please reach out. And thank you all for taking the time to be here. Um, I appreciate it. Sorry, it's sort of a gloomy topic on a sunny day, but um, <laughs> all, all things that are going to be more helpful than harmful to you to know. Agreed. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank thanks you, everybody. Thank you. Yep, Enjoy the weather care. today, guys. Bye-bye.